Okay, so welcome to the second workshop. Uh, thanks if you were at the first one, and if you weren't, then welcome to this one. So this one is about video editing and sound skills. Uh, and again, there's no cross on it, so I apologize. But it's, uh, it's quite an interesting one because these are the aspects I think that people forget about the most when they get into filmmaking or video production. Because I think people see a camera, people see people pick up the camera, they start filming, and I don't think they kind of realize that there's more to it than that. Um, and I think that the sound is an area that is particularly overlooked and video editing will save you, uh, well, it can make your life either a lot simpler or a lot harder, but um, it can basically save you a lot of the time um, if you uh, need to chop up and sort of improve the quality of the things that you're producing. Um, and you can also do some really creative and fun things with them. It's very rewarding to see a project come together when you're editing um, at the end of it. But as I say, I think these are aspects that people mostly forget when they are doing video production. So today we're going to explore these. So um, yeah, this is obviously the second of uh, three workshops. And as I say, we're going to do sound production and video editing. Um, as last time, I think it's best to have pen and paper for notes because there's a lot to get through. There's a lot to get through today, possibly more than the first session. Um, we'll also have a Q&A session at the end. Um, but uh, as always, the best thing to do is to practice if you actually want to get experience and, um, you know, get good at these things. So um, listening to a presentation or, you know, taking part in a workshop is one thing, but, um, you know, actually getting your hands on some sound equipment or, you know, getting out there um, and recording stuff, you know, getting the stuff that you've shot and starting chopping up, that's how you're going to learn. So um, there's really no substitute for practice. Okay, so um, introduction to post-production. You remember this from last time, if you are here last time. There are three stages of productions. Um, the first one is pre-production. That's your planning stage, and we covered a little bit of that last time. Your production stage is when you're using your cameras and your sound equipment. And the post-production stage is when you're editing it all. And as ever, the red flag is if somebody says, we'll fix it in post, because basically that means that they've let a problem slip through pre-production and production, probably on production, and they're like, oh, the light's poor, or oh, you know, the wind's really bad, and say, ah, well, we'll fix it in post. And oftentimes that means that Poor editor, if it's someone else, or if it's you, you've given yourself a headache because you're sitting in front of the computer with this footage that has all these problems with it and you're tearing your hair out trying to fix it. Um, so if somebody says, we'll fix it in post, alarm bell should start ringing. So that's just a golden rule. Okay, so um, an introduction to sound skills. I think we're gonna go through sound first um, because that's probably the um, a natural progression from the camera skill stuff that we did last time. So sound is often overlooked, but in my opinion, it's, it's just as important as video. It's not just my opinion, it is just as important as video. Um, so the thing about sound is that your microphones or the sound equipment that you're using, are going to, it's gonna pick up sounds that you aren't going to notice yourself. So when we are, you know, sitting in our living room, we filter out the noise of the clock or we filter out the, the, the background hum of whatever electronic equipment's in the house. So if we're in the kitchen, we don't listen to the fridge. Um, if we're in a coffee shop, we don't listen to the, um, the the noise of the of the people talking in the background or the coffee machine. We all just filter it out. The problem is that the, um, the microphones won't do that. And when you get your sound recordings and you bring it back to the edit suite, and you're sitting and you're playing it back, suddenly you realize, oh no, the audio is terrible. What can I do to fix it? Well, unfortunately, um, it's extremely hard to fix. Um, if your camera's got a built-in microphone, um, it's also likely to be very, very poor. Um, so um, if you think that you're using your camera mic and it's gonna be fine, chances are it's not gonna be. Um, it's probably gonna give you very, very poor quality. Um, it can also pick up the internal noise that the camera um, is doing, sort of like the, 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 the motors are running. Um, but obviously, if you've got some experience with sound tech before, that'll help you out too. Um, and a golden rule uh, is that people will forgive bad video, but they won't forgive bad sound. And what that means is if your footage is a little bit choppy or a little bit ropey, then people can live with it. It's not ideal, but people can live with it. But if your sound is irritating and there's a lot of background noise and people really have to strain and it just is irritating, that really gets people a lot more than bad video does. Okay, so here's the difference that a mic makes. This is my um, friend Ross, who I filmed recently for a, for a BBC project, and uh, we're at the top of um, uh, Benarty Hill. And uh, Ben Benarty, <laughs> it's his pronunciation of this, Benarty Hill. So have a listen. Um, the first one is without a mic, and the second one is with a mic. Hi there, my name is Ross Cunningham from Glenrothes, and this morning, me and my dog Dex are out on Benarty Hill in Fife. 
Hi there, my name is Ross Cunningham from Glenrothes and this morning me and my dog Dex are out on Benarty Hill in Fife. So could you hear the difference there? Basically the first one, you can obviously hear a lot of background noise, you can hear the wind, you can the, the sound is a bit further away. Um, when you hear the second one, all of that noise is taken out and it's just the sound from Ross, which makes life um, a lot simpler if you're trying to cut it back or noise. Now, depending on where you are, you might want a little bit of background noise and you can obviously adjust your settings for that. Um, but um, I would always say it's best to get the cleanest audio that you can because it gives you the most options later on in the edit. Okay, so there's different types of microphones. Um, obviously the ones there, you can see there's a boom mic. There's like a, a mic you'd use if you were at a karaoke. Uh, you've got the lapel mics, which go on your neck. You've got, um, you know, uh, desk mics. Um, for our purposes, the ones that we're probably going to be using most in terms of video production are lapel mics, which are the ones that are just here. Uh, they sort of what the small ones. Um, if you point out, it's this one here. Uh, and also we're probably going to use a shotgun mic. And shotgun mic's normally at the end of a boom pole. So let's have a look at those. Also, lapel mics are also called lavalier mics, just for reference. Um, so a shotgun mic is usually found at the end of a boom pole. Um, they pick up sound mostly in a single direction. Um, so you can see that by the fact that it's um, pointing. Um, it's very straight and direct. Um, it's useful in film productions when you're recording things like, for example, dialogue. So if you have it on the boom pole, you lift up the boom pole. Uh, it's obviously stretched quite long. And the person's standing out of the way and they're sort of angling the microphone to pick up the sound as they need to. Um, the a disadvantage of that is obviously it can be quite heavy on the arms and it can be very tiring for the person who's holding it. Um, the very, uh, a lapel mic, for example, is, is, is you know, much simpler to use um, because basically it's just a wired mic that feeds down through the person's clove, um, clothing uh, and then it'll kind of go into the sound unit in the person's pocket or onto a transmitter and um, it can be very discreet and it can be very well hidden. The problem with lapel mics is that inevitably there's going to be maybe just a little bit popping up and the collar because obviously the microphone has to have a space where it's clear to pick up sound from the mouth. And so when you're doing that, unfortunately, um, it's gonna be visible. So if you're doing a drama production and you want it to look authentic, you can't really do um, a period drama where everyone's got little microphones on their collars. It's just not gonna work. So the alternative is just, you're gonna to have to use a boom pole with a shotgun, probably a shotgun mic on the end. Um, there's also mic stands, which could be useful if you are, for example, doing a, a conference or a presentation, etc. Um, okay, so um, there's basically you've got your omnidirectional mics and your directional mic would be like a shotgun. So an omnidirectional mic captures things in a 360 degree area. So a lapel mic is an example of that because it basically, if you imagine that in the center is the microphone, the 360 degree kind of circumference is where uh, all the sounds can get picked up from. Shotgun mic by comparison, um, it will still pick up a little bit of sound from around but it's mostly directional. It's mostly pointing in direction and it's mostly going to pick up sound in that area. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's worth being aware of this difference because um, you know, if you're trying to record, um, for example, use a shotgun mic to record um, the sound between a sort of a 360 degree space, you're really not going to pick it up very good in the areas that are behind the shotgun microphone. Um, but then equally, if you're using an omnidirectional mic um, and you're meant to be focusing on just one person who you're pointing at, um, the uh, omnidirectional mic is also going to pick up the sound behind you as well. So you need to think about the type of microphone you need for your purposes. It's also sound recording units. Um, basically, you have to decide where your sound's going into, um, and it's best to record this into a dedicated sound unit. Um, there's a number of different types of these. Um, uh, I use a DR05. Um, uh, I've also used a Zoom H4 and a Zoom H1. The one on the top there is a Zoom H1. I also use a Tascam 60D, which is below. Um, Basically, these are dedicated units that let you feed your sound straight into them. Um, some cameras will let you feed your audio straight into them. Um, but the problem with this is that you can be fighting against the automated settings and sometimes you're not able to turn this off. Um, this is quite a problem because um, if you're feeding your sound straight into the camera and the camera decides, oh, that's too quiet, I'm going to increase the volume, or that's too loud, I'm going to bring it down, oftentimes it gets it completely wrong. Um, in fact, almost always it gets it completely wrong. And the result of that is that the audio when you're playing it back is just all over the place and it's a nightmare. Um, it can cause all sorts of issues. Um, now, some cameras are very good at it and, and, and you know, I use a GH5 and a GH5 doesn't have this issue because you can turn off any sort of automated settings. It's not a problem. Um, but if you are recording straight into the camera, it can cause you issues. Um, 
The mobile phone uh, can be a good uh, sound recorder as well. Um, you can put a lapel mic on it and feed straight into your mobile phone. Um, I'll show you a bit more about that in a wee sec. Um, but also for storage, um, audio files take up a lot less storage on your hard drive than video. So um, you won't need as much hard drive space. Okay, so here's a really simple phone setup. Okay, so you can create a very simple lapel mic using your mobile phone. Um, basically, um, you just need to get a lapel microphone that's compatible. I use a Rode SmartLav because I just find they're really, really good. Um, they're great quality, they're about 50 pounds. Um, and then you get your app. And uh, ironically, this is a picture of an iPhone, but um, iPhones won't really work very well with this because you've got the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, which if you have an iPhone, you'll know that Apple removed that um, because they want to sell you adapters. So as a result of that, um, you, uh, you know, Apple, it's their, it's their own thing. You know, if you, if you like your iPhone, fantastic, but it does mean that you, you're going to have to get an adapter to obviously unplug the thing into it. Um, but then in theory, um, if you have uh, an adapter or if you have a 3.5 millimeter feed, you have your microphone, you plug that in to the phone, you use your voice recorder app or a voice memo app and you just hit record and normally you can get very, very clean audio from that. Now, make sure to check it, make sure it works beforehand, make sure that the microphone you've got is compatible with your phone because there can be some issues there. Just if you're buying it on Amazon or buying it online, just check to see does this work with a mobile phone or does this work with whatever. And it's just worth checking that, especially if you're using, as I say, an iPhone uh, or an Apple device, because it is going to cause you issues in terms of making sure you have that compatibility. Um, I'll be honest, I've not checked. I presume that there are um, mics that fit directly into um, your Apple handset, but I don't use Apple, so I wouldn't know myself. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, if, if you have this option, it's a very, very cheap uh, option. One thing to bear in mind, though, you have to make sure that your phone's not going to go off. So turn it on airplane mode or, you know, put it in do not disturb mode or something like that. Because otherwise, if you're recording something and then the phone goes off, then, you know, you've kind of blown it. Okay. Um, another consideration is wired versus radio mics. Um, the challenge when using microphones is when uh, you're using wires because obviously that can create things like trip hazards. Um, the wire can get tangled, it can get pulled, it can get worn. Um, and all this sounds, this sounds really straightforward and obvious, but the thing is, People forget how real that problem actually is. Um, so you can get a wireless transmitter, which if you look at this picture here, this woman's got one on her hip. Um, and that doesn't, it basically just avoids there being a big wire trailing between her and the camera. Other problems as well happen, I don't know how many times, I'd probably say at least 50% of the time when you finish recording someone who's got a wired mic on, as soon as you say, right, that's it, great, well done, um, press the off button on the camera or, or the sound unit, They'll like, oh great, and then they'll turn and they'll just sort of walk and they'll just sort of relax <clears throat> and they forget there's a wire between them and the camera and all of a sudden they get pulled or the camera gets pulled or they walk off and this happens at least 50% of the time. So you have to be really, really, really ready just to say, oh, just stay there, please don't move. Um, and if you have a wireless unit, then obviously that takes that issue away. But the problem is your wireless units are gonna cost way, way, way more than your, uh, your, your wired ones. Um, so um, a good one that I use, again, it's a roadie one. It's about 150 quid when I got it. Um, but by comparison, I can get a decent wired mic for about 20 pounds. So, you know, you have to, you have to kind of weigh up. Um, okay, now we're getting into the nitty gritty stuff. Mono and stereo. So some of you may already be familiar with this, but mono is basically when the audio is coming on one track. Stereo is when the audio is on two tracks. So our ears obviously have a left ear and a right ear. And stereo basically mimics this by having a left speaker and a right speaker. So we can create a sense of a three-dimensional space by having different volumes and, and sounds coming from different directions, which our ears kind of process to create a sort of sense of, um, of immersion of space. Um, if you have a mono track, a mono track basically means that there's one track. Um, and then if you have a stereo track, it basically means there's two tracks. There's a left and a right. And the left goes in your left ear and the right goes in your right ear. And that's why sometimes it can sound funny if you put your headphones on the wrong way, because some sounds are sometimes meant to be coming for your left and coming for your right. Um, so obviously they have their advantages and disadvantages. Mono is great insofar as when you're recording a mono track, you um, don't have to worry about, um, you know, um, sound being really loud in one ear and very quiet in the other ear because it's going to be flat. Basically, the sound feed coming into both ears is identical, basically. So um, it's consistent. However, it's not three-dimensional and it will sound flat, for lack of a better word. Um, a stereo recording gives you that sense of three-dimensional space. 
But the problem there is that obviously, um, if you have all the sound coming in one direction, and this here sounds really quiet, it can sound like someone is over here, and it sounds like um, there's nothing in this here at all. So that could be deliberate. If you have, for example, characters in a, in a drama on one side of the room, someone's on the left and someone's on the right, have the sound come from each direction. Um, but obviously it's uh, it's very much, um, you know, interchangeable. If you're doing a straight piece to camera to record like a, you know, a small video to camera, then you probably just want to have a you know, mono feed. It's pretty straightforward. If you're doing a three dimensional, big epic thing that's going in cinema, um, then you probably want to make sure it's stereo. So you have that sense of three dimensional space. Um, a surround sound system is basically kind of like a more advanced version of stereo because it's just basically more tracks coming from more directions. So um, if you're thinking like, um, say it was like a five point surround sound or whatever, then you've got um, like five speakers effectively around you um, or seven or however many it is to give you that sense of three-dimensional immersion. Okay, so sound levels themselves. Um, sound is measured in decibels um, and it's usually represented in bars. Um, so in a stereo setup, there's obviously two bars. Um, in a mono setting, um, they will uh, basically, there'll still probably be two bars, but they'll just be identical because um, it's just basically the sound in both is going up and down at the same time. Uh, in a stereo, you'll notice that both will kind of fluctuate depending on which has got more sound in the left, which got more sound in the right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so the left is obviously L, the right is R, and your decibels are dB. So your sound levels, you're, you can see here um, on the right, um, you, you kind of have a green range which um, is, is basically the audio there is kind of clean. Um, between minus six to minus 12 is sort of like your kind of kind of comfortable range. And um, when I'm editing videos, I try and get around minus six to minus 12. Um, when you get into the sort of yellow or orangey area, that's when your sound is starting to peak. Um, and basically, well, it's not peaking, that's when you're close to peaking. And basically that means that your sound's getting just a little bit too loud for comfort. It's maybe just a little bit too loud. And then when you're in the red, that means you're peaking. So peaking is when you record sounds that are louder than the settings of the microphone are adjusted to take. And what that means is distortion starts to happen. First of all, it's extremely loud and it can be very uncomfortable listening to. Um, but second of all, it's just that the, the actual microphone can't record sounds above that level. So it starts to get distorted, it starts to get all flattened out. It starts to sound really tinny and horrible. Um, and if you've recorded something, um, any sort of audio before, um, and somebody shouted, you've probably heard the audio when they've shouted suddenly got really terrible. That's what's happened, basically. The, um, the sound has gone above the sensitivity of the microphone. So what you need to do then at that point is adjust the settings of your microphone, turn down the sensitivity. Usually there's a dial or um, just a few buttons you can use there. You can see on the Tascam DR05 here um, that the, the, the lines here are going from left to right. And you can see here that they're represented vertically as if they were on a piece of editing software. Um, the main thing is that you're gonna to have to monitor this. So when you start um, you know, monitoring sound levels to start recording, obviously you wanna check out your headphones, but you wanna keep an eye on the, the unit and keep an eye on the levels. And if somebody is sort of fluctuating kind of comfortably within the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the sensitivity where it's all fine, it's great. If it's consistently pushing right to the top and it's like, you know, right at the edge, you're peaking and you need to turn the sensitivity down. Um, if you get that wrong, you, you won't be able to fix it because the distorted audio can't be repaired, basically. Um, headphones, um, obviously monitor your audio with headphones. Um, I would say use headphones rather than earphones because earphones can contribute towards build up of earwax, uh, put objects in yours, can damage them. Um, and I have some personal experience with this. Um, I used earphones for a long time um, and because I just thought they were convenient to have in my pocket and I ended up having to go see an ear specialist because I had a massive wax build up for the amount of time I was using them from, uh, uh, from, from filming. And as a result of that, I ended up going <laughs> basically deaf in one ear for about a week um, until I managed to get it fixed. So yeah, I recommend headphones. Also the better at canceling out background noise. So if you can see here, for example, um, there's like a train going by, um, but that guy has got earphones on. So a lot of the noise of the train will be completely mitigated more so than they would be if they were from earphones. Um, and also um, you can get noise cancelling uh, headphones, which can be really, really good. Um, good headphones are obviously more expensive, depending on what you're filming or where you're filming, some points might be appropriate. And uh, remember to monitor the sound levels as well. So just because you've checked it on your headphones and it sounds fine, doesn't necessarily mean it's coming through fine on the sound recorder. So you need to do both. You're gonna to have to listen on your headphones and make sure that there's no sort of background noises or whatever um, that are distracting. And you're gonna to have to monitor the sound levels to make sure that the, uh, the sound is within the right place.
and it's not peaking. Um, the environment. Okay, so important that you choose the right environment. Um, as we said before, lots of environment uh, noise, background noise. So if you're by a road, you're going to get traffic. If you're in a coffee shop, you're going to get people talking. Um, and if you record by the coast, you're going to hear things like waves. Um, oftentimes they're very subtle and our brain filters it out. Um, rain on umbrellas. If you're recording someone in the rain with an umbrella, that can be so distracting. Um, beware of any echo, because if you're in a space that echoes, the microphone's going to pick up the echo. So you can get software that reduces it, but it's expensive and it's not always accurate. Um, and you normally have to buy this separately from your your, uh, your, your sort of standard video editing software. Um, so the best thing to do is mitigate that as much as possible um, by turning off the fridge um, for 10 minutes. Um, if you've got a big hum, turn off the fan, turn off the television, um, definitely turn off the radio. Um, politely ask people to be quiet when you're filming um, and be prepared to move if necessary. If the space isn't appropriate and you can't mitigate the sound, then just don't worry about it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pause for 10 seconds. Um, listen to your room. And I just want you to listen to what sounds you can hear that you'd filtered out without even realizing it. Okay, so we're gonna take 10 seconds, all right? Let's just do it now. Okay, and I bet just in those 10 seconds there, you heard things in the room that you had completely filtered out, wherever that had been. The For me, it was the hum of the uh, some of the computer equipment, actually. Um, and also um, there was just a little bit of noise outside coming through the window. So um, as I say, there's things that we won't hear, but the microphone will pick up. Okay, the wind is your enemy. <laughs> so basically the wind will distort and destroy your audio. It's an absolute nightmare. Um, normally it can also peak as well. So, and um, because the wind can be so loud, normally it also, as well as hearing the wind sound, um, overshadowing the noise of your uh, speaker or the person on the microphone, it can also cause peaking and really hurt the volume. Um, so um, in heavy wind, your audio is probably going to be completely ruined. Light wind, you can probably get away with, but um, heavy wind, it's going to completely ruin it. So you use a windshield, um, which is basically sort of a furry um, cover. Um, you have a, a dead cat, as it's called, um, which uh, obviously please don't be upset if you like cats, but uh, a dead cat is basically just a shield you stick on top of the um, of the shotgun mic or um, other types of mic. Um, and basically the sort of furry texture on it allows the wind to sort of glide through it and it sort of just acts as a buffer for the wind. Um, and you also get ones for your lapel mics as well. So we're going to do a demonstration of that. Um, here again from the same video as before is uh, the audio that came straight off the camera, which you can hear the uh, the noise of the wind and the, the audio which was recorded on the microphone, which was a lapel microphone. John Knox's pulpit, which is a stunning waterfall, which leads on to a gorge. It's one of the most beautiful parts of Fife. So yeah, you can see straight away there that obviously the first version of that was completely distorted. The wind just completely took away any of the speaker sound. It was impossible to hear anything. The second version with the windshield on, no issue at all. Um, it's exactly the same uh, time, exactly the same bit of audio. Just one is straight off the camera mic using uh, without using a windshield. Um, and the other one is a lapel mic, uh, which has a windshield on it to block out the effect of the wind. So huge difference there. It's amazing what a little bit of like, fabric, the difference it can make. Okay, music. Um, so obviously it's a fantastic addition to your video, but there's a number of things to consider. Um, copyrighted pop music is almost a complete non-star. Um, basically the cost of using this week away is huge um, and trying to do the admin for that is, is just not worth it. Um, so you can get royalty free music online. There's a lot of libraries, especially on YouTube. Um, most will actually give you a credit for the upload um, uh, when, when, you, when you upload the video to YouTube or Facebook or whatever. But there's often limitations such as, for example, you can only use this on YouTube, or you can only use this on Facebook, or you can only use this forever, or we 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 won't let you upload this here. Um, they can all be very sort of you know um, detailed in terms of the limitations they've got on it. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, it's sometimes easier to just buy an individual track from like a stock library. So if you go into like for example, um, Audio Jungle is a good one, or Shutterstock. Um, and they will just give you a lot of really, really good tracks. It can cost somewhere between like 30 to 50 quid. Um, obviously that's a fair bit of cash. Um, you can get cheap free music, which you just have to give a credit for usually. Um, but again, you're gonna have to put the credit on it and there may be limitations in terms of where you can do it. YouTube's a good place to check out, um, especially audio library on YouTube. 
Um, you can also pay for a subscription to a music library and I use Artwist. Um, Artwist is really good. It costs me about 150 quid a year though. Um, and so if you're not doing uh, that many videos that are going to require music, then you have to ask yourself if that's worth it or if you're willing to just spend half an hour, 10 hour trawling through YouTube looking for an audio track that's appropriate that you can, that you can use. Um, but one thing as well is that if you're using music, you're almost always going to have to lower the music uh, volume to a level where you can still hear the speakers um, because uh, oftentimes people don't mix it right. And basically, if they have the, the, the speaker here and then the audio, the, the music's underneath, that's fine. But then if you have the music and the audio at the same level, uh, the music and the dialogue at the same level or sound, um, you, you, you can't hear either because they're just drowning each other out. So you have to try and balance it so that if you have uh, people speaking, make sure that's up on high and you have the music um, but whoa. and then when people stop speaking you can bring the volume of the music back up again um, you can obviously adjust the settings of that when we come to editing um, and obviously uh, make sure you match the right tone so if you've got a serious piece don't put loads of jingly happy music in it and if you've got a happy piece don't put really kind of um, sad music on it you know it's all about getting that right but that's a creative choice for you guys to make um, okay to, to bring it all together um, so start with the mono tracks uh, to build experience um, it probably just kind of uh, helps if you don't have that confidence yet um, so um, if you if you just want to sort of like um, record things as mono, then that that's uh, sort of export things, create videos that are mono tracked. That may be simpler in the short term where you get to grips or sort of balance and levels and all the rest of it. Um, always check you haven't put the headphone in the wrong place. This is so common. Um, if you have a sound unit and you put the microphone in uh, the bit that's for the headphones and you put the headphones a bit that's for the microphone. Um, I've done it a few times. Uh, it's a pain because then uh, you know, you're wondering why isn't the sound coming through? Or even worse, if you do it and you don't check um, and you realize you've got you know, terrible audio because it's just been recording from onboard microphones. So always test the settings before you record. There's a lot of different cables that connect sound equipment together. So um, obviously the 3.5 is very common for mobile phones and um, other sort of things like, you know, you know, uh, MP3 players and all the rest of it. Um, but there's also XLRs that will plug into sort of amps and so on and so forth, um, TRS. Um, that will be for other equipment. Um, so if you're plugging in sound equipment from um, maybe like a big speaker um, a concert into a sound unit, then you need direct cables for that. That's obviously way more advanced. So if you get into that kind of stage, you probably want to look at hiring a dedicated sound technician. Um, or obviously we can talk about that in the more advanced um, skills section next week. Next week, um, But it's kind of, um, you know, just making sure you have the right tools for the job more than anything else. And don't use the wrong microphone. Because if you use the wrong microphone, um, as I said before, if you try and record um, uh, an interview uh, which requires a lapel microphone um, or a shotgun directional microphone, if you try and record that with an omnidirectional microphone that records in 360 degree sound um, and you're in a busy room, you're going to pick up the sound of all the room around you. So just make sure that you use the right kind of tools for the right kind of job. Okay. Oh, and one thing which I can't believe that I mentioned here, but when you're recording video and when you're recording audio, um, what you need to do to make sure you can sync up is you need to clap right at the start of when you start recording. And the reason for that is because if the person's seen the clap on camera and you can hear the sound of the clap on your audio recording, you can then sync up the sound with the audio, with the video very, very easily because you just get the point where the, uh, where the clap was in the video and you get the point where the sound occurs in the audio. And when you're in the editing process, you just put the two of them together and then, aha, it's all synced up. Happy days. Okay, cool. So um, very quick equipment overview, microphone, headphones, sound recording unit. Um, obviously with camera equipment as well, you can start with simple equipment using wired mics and mobile phones, et cetera, before building up to a more professional set. Okay, okay, so let's go straight into the video editing section. Okay, so video editing is in post-production. Remember the three stages of production that I talked about. So that's when you take all the footage and audio that you've recorded and you start cutting it all together. Yeah, you take all the footage that you've got, take all the audio you've got, and you're starting to cut it. And then the term cut or cutting, that comes from the days when you were physically cutting up film stock and gluing it together to create a film reel. Um, and that would obviously be a reel that was played out in real time at a cinema. Um, obviously, we've just kept the terms. So um, when I'm talking about cutting or um, all the rest of it, splicing, etc., that's where those terms come from. Um, it's a long process. It can mean long hours in front of the computer, very time consuming, requires a lot of patience and attention to detail. But if you get it right, it can be very rewarding. I'll be honest, sometimes I dread editing, depending on how well the shoot's gone, because we've got tons and tons and tons and tons of clips. Then it's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? There's so much to get through. But 
if you if you have a, a shoot where you film what you need and you're organized that's what i was talking about before when we were talking about pre-production and making sure you don't overshoot etc you've got the material you need and it's easier to swap all together um when you're filming you want to make sure that you shoot for the edit and you think what am i going to use don't just keep shooting 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 and end up with tons of footage that's going to take forever to get through um if you know what you need to edit and you shoot with the edit in mind it can be quite an enjoyable process and very rewarding so common types of software there's a few different types of editing software um i use adobe premiere pro final cut pro x is very popular um it's only on apple though so the top one there is premiere and the bottom one there is final cut pro and um, there's also Avid, which I used to use a lot back at STV. It's very, um, very industry standard. Um, but I also think Avid is really kind of um, outdated in the way it does things. DaVinci Resolve, um, which is very widely available. Um, and I believe it's it's free. Um, so uh, uh, you could, you know, you could probably get free trials of all of these. Um, but I think DaVinci Resolve is, is free. Maybe someone can correct me if, if, um, if I'm wrong about that. Um, and there's a lot of people start to use that now. Um, there's obviously lots of other different types of uh, software to adjust individual elements. So for example, if you need to um, you know, adjust the sound uh, in, a, in, a, in a sound file, you can always get sound adjusting um, equipment, which can let you do kind of like you know, modifications like Audition or, or Pro Tools. There's also After Effects and Motion, which will let you do things like fancy special effects and graphics. Um, you can get 3D modeling software if you want to create a big fancy dinosaur running across the screen or something like that. Um, but those are all different specialized bits of software that do specialized bits that can feed into a video project and a video editing um, software. Um, but it's important to be familiar with the basics of video editing first, and then the more advanced stuff like special effects or blah, 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 building a big 3D dinosaur that comes later on. Um, mobile phones and tablets generally have a lot simpler software available, which offer a lot less features. Um, and bear in mind that the good stuff you might have to pay for, um, and it can be expensive. Um, so again, the subscriptions um, for some of these packages or just buying them outright um, can cost a lot of money. Um, normally though, if you get Premier Pro, for example, there's a student and teacher discount. So if you if you get if you're a teacher, I know at least one person in this chat is a teacher, then uh, you can get a discount. Okay, uh, mobile phone apps. Um, some of the best ones because a lot of you guys will probably be editing on your mobile phones um, or or your tablets. Um, some of the best ones are uh, Premiere Rush, which is like a, a trimmed mobile version of Premiere Pro, um, iMovie, which is obviously Apple's one, and you can't get that on uh, Android phones, uh, and Filmmaker Pro. Um, so again, there's a lot of different types, uh, some you have to pay for. Do a Google, get familiar with the ones that you think are best for you. Um, they all effectively operate in a very similar way. Um, I would say though that I think editing on a mobile phone is very hard because the screen is, is too small to, in my opinion, I think it's really, really hard to do it properly. Um, on a tablet, sure, no problem. And on a computer screen, absolutely. But on a, on, on a mobile phone, the screen is so small and you're obviously playing about with so many different sort of little bits. Um, I find it quite difficult. So I don't recommend it, but I recognize some people will be doing that and some people find it comfortable enough. So fair enough. Okay, so your workflow process. Basically when you're editing, you're following a workflow. And that means um, when you start, you may wish to organize at the start, the start, start that workflow um, by uh, naming your clips, putting things in folders, making sure it's all in the right place. That will save you time later on because you obviously have to know what all the files are. And if you are presented with a folder that's got about hundred clips in it, and all those clips are, you know, file 001, file 002, file 003, et cetera, you don't know what that is. So you might want to take just a little bit of time just to quickly watch it all and, and name what, what's what, et cetera. Um, that can obviously be time consuming. Um, then you start it by um, importing the clips into the software. So these are then shown in what's called a bin or a folder. Um, then you will then start taking those clips and you'll start weighing them down onto a timeline or a sequence, which is where everything's sort of weighed out. Um, you select the clips, you put them in the right place, etc. You adjust the length, you trim them uh, to the bits that you like and don't like. You cut what you don't need and you fine tune the bits that you like. And then once you've got a completed sequence or a timeline, look it all over and when you're ready, you export it. Um, here is the way out of a typical video editing uh, piece of software. So any, every bit of software looks different, um, but most of all, very kind of similar layouts. So if you mirror yourself with the way out generally, you'll be able to spot the same tools and features um, in other software. So um, here's mine, right? So basically um, that's from uh, the Cold Premiere, which uh, was a film that we did last year, uh, which Craig's in, there's Craig on stage actually. Um, so um, the bin, 
as I said before, that's where all your files will be kept. Um, so you'll be able to see all the files. There's obviously not many here because this was just a quick one that I did um, as a demonstration. Um, your effects bin, so all the effects that you can apply, such as, for example, um, uh, video effects, transitions, audio effects, etc. cetera. Um, the source window. So when you double click on a file in the bin, it'll show up in the source window and you can see what is that you're actually going to, to what the clip is that you selected. Um, you then drag those clips into the timeline in the order that you want them, et cetera. So it's like, okay, basically start here, double click. Hmm, oh, I like that clip, I'll put that there. Hmm, double click, oh, I like that, I'll put that there, et cetera. Drag it down into the timeline of the sequence. And then you can see what's in the timeline display in this folder, in this, uh, in this window. Now, some uh, pieces of editing software obviously um, have uh, different layouts and the way they'll do it is a bit different. I actually customized my um, Premiere a little bit. They've changed it now. So I think that this is no longer here. It's somewhere else now. But I like to keep mine traditionally because this is the way it was always set out when I learned it. Um, and most of them are laid out in a very similar way to this. Um, it, it, as I say, it's very hard to explain this um, using uh, pictures and words. So I'm going to give you a visual demonstration shortly. I'm actually going to go into some editing software and I can show you guys this stuff in real time. Um, the basics, when you're starting out, it's very easy to be overwhelmed because there's so many options and so much information, but don't panic. Um, very few people know everything there is to know at the start. Um, so you only need to know a few basics to start getting good results. Obviously there's your arrow key, right? So you click on your arrow key and that way actually select stuff. So if we go back to where we were before, arrow keys here. So if you need to select something, click on the arrow key, you drag, you drop, etc. If you want to cut something, you would click on the cut and then you would say, right, okay, I've got the cut tool, which you would click here to get, because that's the cut tool. And you would go quick, 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 quick. And you would just um, select the bits that you didn't want, cut, 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 and then you would just delete them. You would then get a magnet. So a magnet's really useful, or it's sometimes called a snap tool, because basically what it does is it takes two bits of clips and it sticks them together so there's not gaps between them. So you can turn it on and off. If you want a gap between clips, fair enough, you can do that. But if you have the magnet on, it'll snap together. Um, and text, just obviously very straightforward because your text will let you type up text and so on and so forth. Um, so um, obviously there's an effects panel, which you can stick different effects on, which are for your audio and your video. Um, on the timeline here, um, which you can see uh, on the top right, um, basically there are layers of tracks. So your video is going vertically and your audio is going um, like, well, vertically upwards and your uh, audio is going vertically downwards. So your video tracks are V1, V2, V3. Your audio tracks are A1, A2, A3. And you can add more tracks both directions. Um, so obviously the video is on top, the um, uh, audio is on the bottom. Um, and obviously you can see there's two tracks there, your L and R are represented by the two sort of wiggly lines for your left and right stereo audio. Um, I think that's actually mono audio from the way that's looking. I um, need to check that because it looks like they're identical in terms of their levels. Um, but um, yeah, the, uh, the, the clip there uh, is obviously on V1. If I put another clip down, if I put it next to it, then it'll play the first clip and it'll play the second clip. If I put the next clip on top of it, it, the, the software will always play the video that's the highest level. So for example, if I put a clip down and there's a clip on top of it, it will then cut to the next angle, etc. So that's a way of like overweighing clips. Um, your audio basically just wears up. So it doesn't really have that sort of hierarchy in terms of the structure, but it will just mean that the more tracks that you have of audio, you can put your sound um, for your speakers and then you add your music underneath that and then you add sound effects or whatever, etc. It's all weird like that. So I'm going to do a quick demonstration um, and I'm going to just demonstrate some very simple techniques. Um, this demonstration is going to include a basic tool. So we're going to show making a cut, uh, transitions, um, just some simple effects and color correction. So the skills shown here are very transferable amongst different software. So don't worry if you get a bit of editing software and it doesn't look like this. Um, the way out is going to depend entirely on the software that you use. Um, but the main thing here is just to pay attention to what we're going to do. Okay, so let's swap over to Premiere Pro. Okay, so we're in Premiere Pro. First of all, as I said, there is um, all of these different um, windows. You've got the bin here. Basically, if we um, go here, we've got all the different clips that are kind of in our bin. So we've imported these. Now, obviously it's like a file directory, just like it would be on your desktop computer. So here's a bunch of clips that I did for a shop called The Flower Ranger. These haven't been um, named. So you can see, uh, obviously, how nightmarish is to go through all of these 
if you haven't sat and named all the files because obviously it's just a big mountain of text. You don't know what's what, et cetera. However, you can get a visual display. Um, so then obviously you can start seeing, oh, okay, we've got these clips here, et cetera. So what's the different clips? Now, let's take a couple of clips. So, okay, I'll take some roses. The roses are nice. Okay, so do you see what I did there? I just took the clip, I dragged it down onto here, and I just stuck it there. And to see the individual clip, every time I double click on it, you can see it pops up in this window so I can see what the clip is. Okay, now to play it on the timeline, um, let's mute that. Play it on the timeline, obviously you can see it's going from left to right. And obviously that is the actual footage that was recorded. Okay, so it's actually fairly straightforward. You're basically going from left to right. You need to find the clips that you want in the bin, scroll through it, find the bit that you want. Okay, oh, they look nice. Okay, let's take that, etc. cetera. Um, find the bit of the clip that you want. There was some nice stuff, if I recall, um, around about here when uh, we were adding some nice uh, bits of clips. the reception of Baba's Bistro. Oh yeah, that was that. Can you hear me talking there? That's obviously sound from when we were recording it and having a conversation. Um, okay, doke. So then delete the audio there. Just take that off. Okay, doke. And you see, there we are. It's playing in the track. So we've got three clips there. They're obviously very simple. Now, the audio is obviously useless because we don't need the audio. I'll delete the audio. Okay. So what we're going to do is we've got some of these basic tools. Okay. So um, we have the arrow key. Now, using the arrow key, I can select things. And I can obviously drag and drop, move them around, etc. Now, as I said before, I have the, the magnet, that's a snap. So basically if it's off, then it can go wherever it wants. If I put it on, then things snap into place. You see how it snaps into place? Um, it means that it doesn't necessarily have any gaps. If I try to do that manually with it off, it's much harder because obviously I'm trying to, but then you might want to weave a gap for whatever reason. So you might want to do that. And then you might want to do that. And then that would allow you to, you know, do those kind of things um, to give you space to put other things down. Um, as I said before, if I drag um, a clip here, for example, it's actually a very short clip, um, and I put it on top, so dragging it up aware, then obviously we're going to cut from one angle, you'll see very shortly, to another. Ah, okay. See how it's playing the one on top? And then I'll cut back to this one again, because obviously we have, uh, you know, got a bit thing there. Oh, Adobe's just crashed. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> that might, uh, maybe give me a wee second. I'm just going to see if we can open it back up again and see what's going on. That's something that's actually worth bearing in mind is um, software does crash. Um, editing software often crashes. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so let's just um, grab some more clips. Here is just randomly stick a, stick a thing down. Six and settings. Okay. So let's see, uh, I've got a clip here of my good friend Ross running downstairs. So you see obviously how, obviously there's a lot of faff at the start when we're just sort of getting ready to go. Okay, so get it from the point we actually want the clip to start. So I'm gonna cut it here. I'm gonna select this tool, the cut tool. I'm gonna cut that there and delete this part of it. And I could also choose to cut within a clip. I could do that and cut that. Now let's see how that works if I do that. Ah, okay, so I've just got the bit that I want. But even then, it's maybe a bit, mm, okay, so maybe let's take the start off. So what we do is go to the clip and drag it to the exact point that you want it to start. Okay, and you see how obviously we're quite far away from the start there, from the time codes. We're currently about a minute 57 into the thing, into the sequence. We're going to drag this right back, put it to start. So the very first thing that you see is here. Excellent. Very, very quickly, we're going to just do a transition. So a transition would be, for example, here. Um, that's an audio transition. We'll go here. We're going to do a dip to black. So if I got another clip, let's stick this one down. I'm not sure what's here. Um, but let's just get, what's this? Okay. So if we wanted to do a transition, we could do a dip to black. So obviously you've transitioned. We could do a dip to white. we could do a cross dissolve. You see, so we've got different effects, different impacts, there's loads of different types of these. Um, we can also apply different effects, such as very quickly, if I go to workspace and I go to color, 
Okay, so now we're in power correction stage, which is kind of important uh, thing. Basically, okay, it's a little bit uh, maybe washed out. So let's bring up the brightness, okay, the exposure, bring up the contrast, bring up the saturation, et cetera, et cetera. Let's make the colors a little bit off. Let's do that. Play about with the temperature of the of the um, of the sky and of the area. We can go into color wheels. We can obviously adjust, make it bright red. We can make it blue. We can make it green. We can do all these kind of things. That looks pretty terrible. So let's take that off. But if you want to see the difference between that and what was there originally, you can see the difference already. That was just two seconds of work, just playing about with these settings. And that is in the color panel. Okay, very straightforward. We're very pushed for time, so I think I might need to leave it there. Unfortunately, uh, there's so much to kind of get through. Um, but I think, um, and then obviously you can see here. We probably want to cut at that point. So you can see, obviously, it cuts out. When your video is done, you select it all. You would need to render it. So you would go to render into out, which basically takes the whole thing. And it basically processes it so it's ready to export as a video. And then you would go file. And then you would go export. And then you would save your video which obviously we don't need to do because I'm not at the minute needing to save it anywhere, but you choose where you want to save it and then save it. Um, that's obviously a very, 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 very quick rush demonstration because I'm conscious for a short time. Let's just finish off this presentation, give it a go. Um, don't wait until you need to edit and get practicing now. Uh, there's lots of tutorials and guides online. Um, loads of fantastic resources online. I recommend No Film School, Audio Library, and Terry White is fantastic for Premiere Pro. Um, but there's loads of different ones online you can go and get tutorials from. Um, conclusion, uh, basically, I want you to take away some of these techniques that you learned in workshop one and workshop two. And I want you to create a short 10 to 20 second video to demonstrate um, uh, some of the skills that you've learned. So that obviously is the pre-production, the camera skills, the sound stuff, and the video editing. Uh, put that together. And then the next time when we're here, um, let's just take a couple of minutes at the start just to watch what everyone's kind of made. Okay, so thanks for listening. Join us again in uh, part three to look at advanced techniques. We'll also probably come back and touch up with some of the editing stuff because we didn't get that much time to go into today. It's my fault. Um, and remember, practice makes perfect. So enjoy and have fun.